thank you uh, Intercultural Women's Society for hosting this uh, panel discussion about uh, DACA and uh, some experiences of two DACA students. I'm Professor Mike Itashiki. I teach sociology and uh, these uh, students uh, have graciously uh, allowed me to present this panel discussion. So uh, we have uh, Sonia and Michelle and they are DACA students and you know I'll have them maybe I'll do some questions. Feel free to interject with your own questions you know, as, as they arise. So, uh, Sonia, uh, where are you from? Um, I am originally from San Luis Potosí in Mexico. It's a small town. Um, I was raised here in Texas, in Mesquite, Texas to be accurate, and I have been living here for 19 years. So <laughs> I do consider myself from here, but I am originally from Mexico. Uh, how old were you when you came here? I came here in 1999. Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, what about you, Michelle? Uh, I'm, gonna... I'm originally from Mexico as well. Uh, it's in Chihuahua, so it's like we're neighbors, like Texas and Chihuahua is like neighbors. Uh, I came here about 10 year, 10 almost 11 years ago. Uh, I was 10, so it was like all kind of weird because. You know, I was like starting to have friends and, you know, kind of like grew up over there and then they just kind of took me and like put me here and it was, it was weird. But yeah, I definitely consider myself more of a Texan than Mexican, I guess. <laughs> but, you know, from my hometown, like I definitely can relate to like living in Texas and life here than over there, which is weird. Uh, so how long have you been here? So I've been here for 11 years. Okay. Yes. Uh, so uh, what's your college goals or career goals? Um, I actually want to be a middle school teacher. And like I've been trying to work on that. And I don't know what's going to happen if I'm going to be able to, even if I was to get my degree. Like I don't know if I'm, like I doubt I'm going to be able to work if I don't have my my DACA anymore. So right now it's just like, just trying to get to there and just continue on with my education, just, just to see what happens. Uh, so Sonia, um, I mean, what, was, what was the circumstances of your, your family bringing you here? So um, I am an only child and uh, I was told that I brought I was brought here for a better life, for a better future. And certainly I have gotten better in life and stuff. Uh, I have seen like the news from Mexico and stuff and it is bad over there, many violences and the way Mexico work Mexico's government is low, you could say. Yeah. <laughs> and here there are rules. We have restrictions, you know, which makes us be a better person. And I was brought to start and finish school, and I am the first one to finish high school and to finish to start going to college. So I am very proud of that. Since I am an only child, um, I do consider my parents. Since my mother, she was uh, she only got to third grade. Um, she had to get out to start making money for her living and her food. And my father, he actually made it to the sixth grade and he as well dropped out to bring food to the house. Mm -hmm. And um, so after that, we, my father came over here and he wanted to make a better life for my mother and I. And he worked hard and then he brought us over here I had just turned five when I got here. And I started school here, so when I started school, uh, it was mainly all 
white people. I was the only me only Mexican in the classroom. And it was a really awkward situation for me since I didn't know the language they were speaking. I felt like I was less because I wasn't like them. But within years, I started, um, you know, a school started integrating more and the neighborhoods became more integrated as well. And as I, as I grew up here, um, I started noticing that that um, my parents did make a good choice of bringing me here. And when DACA came out, I I didn't get it the year that it came out. I actually got it like two years after that. And once I got it, I got convinced that maybe I could have a better future with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we'll talk about DACA in a minute. Uh, Michelle, did you also have to learn English? Yeah, so whenever we came over here, we I actually we went to Arizona first in Phoenix. We lived there for a year, and I was in sixth grade, so like I didn't know any English, like zero, like none. And whenever they put me in school, they told my parents that, yeah, like there was gonna be someone, like an interpreter with me, and they were gonna help me, and I was gonna be in uh, like an ESL class, like to teach me, and that didn't happen, so. They threw me in like just regular classes. Like there was no ESL program at all at the school where I was at. So like whenever I was in elementary school, like I loved school, like I loved learning, like I, I enjoyed school. So that first few months that I went to school, it was, it was awful, like I hated it. Like I had no idea what they were saying. Like I couldn't understand it. Like I cried every day. Like I hated going to school, hated it. So. I made my dad buy me a dictionary from Spanish to English and I remember that I would I would cry and I would sit there every day after school like reading every single word and memorizing it and trying to pronounce it like for six months like trying to learn English because it bothered me so much that I had no idea what they were saying. So I sat there literally every day and I didn't go out to like I didn't socialize like I didn't make friends because I was so eager to learn English that I essentially like learned it in six months like I literally sat there reading a dictionary from Spanish to English and I would carry that little that little book with me everywhere like I would go to school and I would carry it and they would be like talking to me and I'm like hold on I have no idea what you're saying hold on and I would just literally word for word like I would try to learn it and that's that's the way I learned how to speak English because nobody was teaching me. So there was there was a six a six month period of me crying and hating school. <laughs> so let me clarify, you said you liked school in Mexico? Yes, I loved school in Mexico. Okay. But when you got here you hated it? It was awful. At least for six months, right? Yes, it was it was awful because um, like I had no idea what any of my teachers were saying. Um, I didn't know, like when people, you know, like you as a kid, if someone's like laughing and kind of looking at you, you think, hey, they're laughing at me. So it was, it was like a shot at my confidence. Like I was a very confident kid. Like I knew what I was doing in school. Like I was in advanced classes, even in elementary school, and that like put me back. I was like, heck, man. So that was that was bad. Sonia, uh, what do you know? What the DACA process is? What do you have to? do? You have to sign up? To sign up? Um, you have to have a background check. Um, you have to be clear of charges for anything. You have to have They're done on nothing. your fingerprints, about. actually. Yes, your fingerprints. They do a background check. And um, you also have to have um, your, what is it called? Your so like they, they actually give you like a list of documents that you have to have. Uh, you yes. have had to be in school for a certain amount of time and you have to prove you have to that. prove that you've yeah. been here that long time. Yeah. yeah, so you, they ask for the school records, they ask for um, the addresses, like all the addresses that you've lived, you've lived in, um, like bills from your parents, uh, what else? You just certainly have to... Yeah, there's, it's like a really long it. list, actually, like a really long list. And then on top of that, you have to pay yeah, so, you have so to much pay. money. 
to so to yes yeah. Do you have to pay that every year or is it just one every time? Every two years, yes, every two years, and um, it is crazy how <laughs> how like you know what you want in life, but you can't get it because of this law that just doesn't allow you to dream. And it really hurts us emotionally, right? It hurts us emotionally and it gets to us because you have to prove that you are like everybody else. And I mean, we are all human and it hurts that we are seen less. And uh, with us proving with our background checks that we're clear and everybody who got accepted, we are clearly good people. <laughs> and many people who didn't get to apply for it or didn't get accepted have like a small charge of something like tickets or and it's just frustrating that you have to show them prove to them that you are innocent there's so. just like so much more than that like you, you you're an only child I have uh, two brothers they're younger than me and the little little one was brought here when when he was three, so all the life he knows is here. Uh, and it's, it was kind of hard to explain to him. Now, you know, he's like wanting to go out with his friends and be kind of stupid and kind of get into trouble, you know? Like, you, you had, like, we had to sit him down, like, with my parents and explain to him, hey, like, there's a lot of things that you can't do. Like, even the littlest thing, like, if you were to get in trouble for any reason, like, I don't know if. In McKinney, there's still a curfew. I knew when, when I was in middle school and high school, there was a curfew that um, kids younger than 16 couldn't, wouldn't be able to be out, like in the street, like at the movies, anywhere past 9 o'clock, 9 or 10. Um, and if you were to get caught, you know, like that would go into your record. Like you as an immigrant, like me as an immigrant, like if I was to not have if I was to get caught, then I wouldn't have been able to get my DACA. So I had like, I, it was heartbreaking for me to explain to my little brother, hey, you have to be like extra careful, like so, like take so many precautions to not get in trouble or anything because they might take you as a reason that we're bad people, even though we're not. You know, like I, I don't drink and drive like obviously I don't, I don't do any drugs like nothing like literally nothing I try to like stay away from that as much as I can and it just sucks because everybody thinks like most people think hey you're an immigrant you you do this and they immediately like oh well you must be doing this you must be doing that or you know it's just like a generalized thing and you have to be so much more careful like I had to think of all the things that I can't say in front of people. Like, I can't really say anything about politics, like, on my Facebook or any social media because they might take that and put it against me. Have you noticed a change um, since Donald Trump was elected? Yeah, yes. definitely. <laughs> can, you, can you describe the, your feeling when DACA first came out, were you all always uh, like uh, optimistic at that point? And then, how did you feel after uh, our new president was elected? Whenever, whenever DACA came around, I was like, it was kind of like, could finally breathe, you know? Like I could finally like work because I saw my parents like they were struggling to pay for everything that we had. Like I tried to get involved in school, like I wanted to be in band and cross country and all these other clubs and that cost money. So I wouldn't, like whenever I got to high school, I, I took the decision that I could not be as involved in school because it was gonna cost my parents more money. And I was not gonna put that stress on them. So I took myself away from that. So you're like, cut, you as a kid, like as a 16, 17 year old, you're cutting yourself from so many opportunities because you don't want your parents to go through that because you don't have the ability to get a job. As soon as DACA came around and I was able to get it, I, I also didn't get it the first year, I got it the second year that was around. It was literally like I could take a breather. Like I started to work, um, I started helping my parents. Like ever since I got it, like I've been 
helping my parents, like, paying for rent, paying for bills, like, everything that I can. And I'm thankful that I had that because now I'm, I'm able to pay for my brother's social activities. Like, my younger brother, I paid for all of his band, like, all of his... Like, they went to Washington, D.C. Like, I paid for all of that because I didn't want my parents to stress over that. And so the same thing with my little, little brother. Like, I pay for all of the things that he wants to do because I don't want him. I don't want to take away that opportunity for him because I didn't have that. And DACA gave that to me. Like, I'm able to work. Like, I'm able to make money and help my parents and help my little brothers. So whenever... Whenever I heard, you know, there was, like, those speculations, like, oh, it might happen. Like, they might take it away. They might not. And it was, like, going, it was back and forth. Like, you would see in the news, good news, and then bad news. And then, oh, no, they're not going to take it away. Oh, no, they're actually going to give you a path to citizenship. Oh, just kidding. They're going to take it away from you. And it was just, like, a back and forth thing. And whenever it was a definite no, like, hey, we're repelling that law, it was, like, I've been working for so long, like trying to make a better life. And now all of that is gonna be taken away from me. For no reason. Like, I don't have any criminal charges. I don't do anything bad. Like I literally just want to work and get a better life. Like that's it. And I'm not gonna be able to. So uh, yes, when DACA came around, uh, like I said, I didn't get it the first year. Um, I was, I was at a younger age, so I really wasn't thinking about it. But um, the year after that, uh, I spoke to an immigrant lawyer who pushed me into getting it and uh, told me that maybe we could work into citizenship and get all these benefits, you know. So I decided to go and apply for it, and I got accepted, and right away I got approved, and I... Um, Remember, I was super excited because I was gonna be able to drive legally, <laughs> and it was just it was just amazing to to feel that you could drive with a driver's license without the cops like stopping you and you worrying about it. And if you're not doing nothing wrong, you know you're you're good. But um, it just it was a, a good change. I felt. I felt the same as everybody else who has papers, who has their documents. Um, I did feel great that I could help my parents out. I was uh, speaking to, doc to Professor Pashima, um, and I was telling her how we don't owe a house. We have been renting a two-story house since 1999, and we have been living there since we've gotten here. And... Um, we can't get a house because we don't have papers, because we don't have a social security. And since I'm an only child, my parents have always been working and I had just been focusing on school. And um, when you're trying to get a house, they obviously look at your credit. You need credit in order to, you know, to buy and make payments and stuff. And you, in order to have credit, you need your social security. We don't have that. <laughs> We can't work into it because we don't have this, because of this, you know? So it just follows up. And um, it really hurts because all that money that we have been paying in rent is basically going to trash. Um, we're just living there, and we can't um, afford something to actually call home. And even though if we did have a home, like, would we, would we be kicked out back to Mexico and just... All that money that we had been wasting just it, it stays there, you know. And um, since ever DACA came out, I had been working on my credit, and since then my credit has been going up and it's doing good. And with that, I am hoping to one day buy my parents a home, and that would just make me feel better as their daughter, you know, because they have helped me. So why not help them? And. Um, I mean, here it's basically you, you live on a routine. You get up, you eat, you go back to work, and you come home and you go to sleep. <laughs> and we don't have as much as privileges as we all need to have. 
and as she was mentioning, we back off from things, from certain things that allow you to socialize more. And I could say we're reserved because we're pushed back from those things that we want to join. So when President Trump came in, that was the extreme worry. <laughs> it was just like all his comments that he had been saying, you know, all those things that just make you feel down, make you feel that you're less of a person. Um, he's rich. He has it all. Too much. <laughs> so it makes him feel empowered. We have nothing. We literally just want food, our home to live in, and just be happy and work within days. And he hasn't suffered, I believe. He doesn't have problems. He has everything he needs. And he... I think he lets his power get into his mind and doesn't actually see what the poor or doesn't he doesn't see what we have to actually suffer through in order to get a plate of food in our house you know and it's it's not even only that like with all the comments that he says like i whenever he was sworn into president's presidency um i sat down with my parents since i'm the oldest one like I came back from work, they sat me down, and they're like, hey, if one day you were to come home and we're not here, this is what you need to do. And, like, I basically have a plan. Like, I don't know. Like, I hope not that I don't walk in one day to my house and my parents are not there. And that's that's a, that's something that I don't know if it's going to happen. Like, it, it might happen. My parents, I might walk in one day and my parents might not be there. I don't know that. Like, I, I don't have that security. I can't legally be deported because I have DACA. And my younger brother can't be deported because he has DACA. But the little, little one and my parents, like, they're not. Like, my parents could be driving to Walmart and be stopped because the tail light of the car is not working. And literally from there, they could get deported. So, like, I don't know. Like, that's something that, like, you probably, like, never thought about that. Like, you know, people that have papers, like, would never think, like, oh, my God, like, what if I come home one day and my parents are not there? Like, that's something that it was very, very hard for me to, like, sit down with my parents. I had to figure out a plan of what to do, what steps to take, how to take care of my brothers if that was to happen. Like, it's just, you don't think about it every day. But every time I scroll down through Facebook and I'm, I see something about Trump, like, it's just, like, that thought, it's immediately in my, in my head. And I'm always, like, in communication with my mom. Like, I always call her, like, hey, are you guys home? Like, hey, are, are you guys coming home? Like, I know what time they get off work. And if they're not there by that time, I'm calling them. Like, I'm blowing up my parents' phones. Like, where are you guys? What's going on? Why are you guys not here? And vice versa, like, they're always like, where are you? Are you good? Like, what's going on? Like, are you coming home? Like, you know, and that's a sad reality. Like, whenever I talk to my friends that are, you know, that are born and raised here, that have papers, and I tell them that they, like, probably never thought about that, but it's a thought that I have, I have to live with. Like, that's something that's scary to, like, come back home and not see your parents. Questions from the audience? I have a question. So how did being um, just a doctor and having a doctor was your college experience? Like applying and getting into the thinking about college? It doesn't, that, um, that didn't really affect me personally since like I had my driver's license and uh, they don't really ask you for um, residency, residency or anything like that. Like they just ask you for a valid ID and like your proof that you've been here, you know, in the county or whatever. So they don't really. I try to keep it on the down low as much as I can. Like I don't like to go around like, hey, 
you know, I, I don't, I try to keep it as low-key as I can. Warn me so I can, I'm recording, I need to have the question on the mic. So you guys said that you guys felt inferior through high school because of a language barrier or because you guys were the minority. But besides those two things, were there any other factors that made you feel inferior in a white prominent society? I did. Um, in fact, like I mentioned, I was the only Mexican girl in class. The color of my skin was was something that I got to, it got to me because I was dark brown. And um, like, it, like I said, it made me feel less because everybody was white and everybody was different color. And I felt that I was just less, that I wasn't supposed to be there. And um, as I grew, like I said, it, school started integrating and um, I saw more cultures. And that just helped me become a better person in my personality. Personality, And um, it helped me seeing all these cultures. It made me, my self-esteem become way better. But besides language and my skin color, I think everything else was, it was okay. Like, um, I had people supporting me. Uh, I was taken into ESL classes and um, up to the third grade, that's when I struggled with language. But after that, that's when I basically learned how to, I could defend myself if someone told me something. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, um, but skin color was something that was really bugging me back in elementary school. Yeah, that was a double-edged sword for me because at first, you know, like I didn't know any English and then I learned it and I was hanging out with a lot of white kids, you know? And then I started talking to more Hispanics. Like I started talking to more groups because I was actually, whenever we came to Texas, I was put in an ESL class. And back in Arizona, like it was mostly white people. And I would get made fun of from both sides, like from English speaking people, like whites and blacks and all that. like. They're like, oh, ha, you have an accent. Because, like, my accent was really thick. Like, it was really thick. And I would push myself to not have that accent. And then when I was hanging out with my Hispanic friends, we were like, why do you talk so white? Why? why? Like, why do you talk so white? Why don't you talk Mexican? So it was just like, what do you want from me? Like, I can't, can't speak with my accent, but I can't speak white. So it was, you know, white. And... It was just like trying to find that middle ground and just trying to come to terms with myself that I was going to talk however I wanted, that I was going to have my accent or I was not going to have my accent. And I had to learn that, like I had to overcome that because if I spoke correctly, like a white person, I felt like I was not being true to my heritage. Like I was, I was being fake with my Hispanic friends. But if I did not lose that accent and I didn't learn more, and I was like, then what am I doing? Like, I'm trying to, I came here to be better. Like, my parents brought me here to, to have a better life. So what's the deal? So it was like, I was stuck. It was like, like, where to go? Like, you don't know where to go. So it was, it was that, that like, you can't speak with an accent or you talk white. It was, it was hard. Yes, guys, I know that you are trying like to be American or by like uh, your journey in this country and the suffering, it might impose on you to assimilate in this culture in order to survive or in this country in order to survive. But in any way, do you feel that you still proud of your Hispanic or Mexican identity? Both of you, I assume that you still practicing and using the language. What about your feeling toward your Mexican identity? Oh, no, believe me, like, after high school, like, struggling with that, I, I got, like, I graduated, and I was like, you know what? Why am I lying to myself? Like, I can literally go from 
country to pop to high school musical to like very very mexican music in like three minutes like I, i'm literally like driving down the street or going to work and i can play like corridos like mm -hmm. in my car like blasting it off and know every single song like every single lyric and then literally go on spotify and listen to justin bieber like i'm very proud of that like i i don't care anymore like I, I'm over that. Like I, I'm, I'm very, like I'm very proud of, of being Mexican and. American. Yeah, and American as well, Texan. Yeah. When I, I would um, try and fit in, and by that I mean, um, as the years went by, and at school we would um, celebrate Christmas, we would celebrate Thanksgiving, Halloween. Um, I really didn't know anything about that. Like, we, we don't really celebrate that, you know? We have other things that we celebrate which are distinct and um, which are interesting at the same time. And at the same time, I was confused because I didn't know if I should celebrate um, our culture or their culture. Would they get mad if I would celebrate my culture? And at the same time... Um, when you, as you grow older, you kind of don't mind it because you know how to control yourself. You, you know what you're doing. And if you're not doing nothing bad, I mean, there's nothing bad with accepting your culture. You're Mexican, you know, you accept it. <laughs> and um, fitting in, like, it's really nice to actually celebrate my Mexican culture and the American culture. I get to celebrate a lot of things. <laughs> yeah, you get like, <laughs> yeah. You get double the food. Yeah. Like, it's, it's awesome. Break like, diets. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Hi, I'm um, just wondering that if, um, I heard about the news that DACA, it's, I'm not sure, just wanted to be, you know, make sure that is DACA still on or is it already been canceled? So, um, President Trump took the decision last month? Yeah, September. yeah September 5th, okay. That it was from, a certain time, if your DACA permit, your work permit was to expire uh, before December, I honestly, I didn't, okay. I, I, yeah, I, go I, ahead. I, 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 I can give you that. Uh, it's the, the dates on it are uh, March 5th, uh, and the other date was October 5th, one month after he had made the decision. Uh, people who were eligible for renewal of DACA needed to uh, put in their application for it. Um, and but people who DACA expire March 6th onward, there's no renewal for them. Mm -hmm. And I've come to find out that the people that had to put in for the uh, March 5th deadline, they are theirs expires two years. I guess it'd be March 5th of 2019. Or 20. Yeah. yeah, well, um, like you had till October 5th to send all your papers right. to like, if, if, because, so whenever you get your work permit for two years, say like I got mine and it expired in December, to get a renewal, I would have to send it in June or July with time for me to like get processed and get my new work permit. So you have to get it six, like you have to send all your paperwork six months before. So that's what this was from October 5th. So like everybody that was getting close to their work permit being expired, that's the time that they had to send it in. Mine was actually, it's expiring in October of 2018. So I didn't get to apply. It was, and it, that's really unfair. I find it because why do these other DACA students get to apply for another two years? And I'm, I'm just. <laughs> it sucks that I don't get to have those other two years. Um, now you said you feel identified with both communities, like American community and the Hispanic community, right? So you have received support for, from both communities, but which one have the, have the most impact in your life? 
besides the, the, your family, the Hispanic community or the American community? I would say the Hispanic community just because um, it's kind of taboo to speak about the situation with your white friends. Like, you know, it's not like a conversation started there that or that people are even interested in talking about or like they would just feel weird. Like, I, I don't know, like I wouldn't go up to someone knowing that I have papers and be like, hey, like if I was a, if I was a white girl, if I was white, you know, blonde hair, blue eyes, I was born here, I would not go to my Hispanic friend and be like, hey, um, are you legally here? Like that's just something that you like that's just something that you don't ask, right? So it's kinda like like you don't talk about it. You don't really talk about it with your white friends because it's just like, dude, what what the heck? Like why are you asking me that? Um so it's kind of taboo to speak about that. So I, I do feel like I get more support from the Hispanic community just because we're kind of in the same place so you get to talk about it more freely than anything. Uh, what, if any, activities uh, have you taken upon yourselves to pressure uh, the government to... Uh, extend DACA or legislatively reform it so that you're here permanently rather than as a, under an executive order? Um, I was actually going to go to D.C. this weekend uh, to go protest and I like... I want you to write a column for uh, Rich Song Chronicle. <laughs> well, about your experience. Keep, keep well, I, I wanted to and... Um, I had, I was pretty much like this close on buying like my plane ticket and um, getting my hotel. And the days, because it's such a, it's a weekend and I'm the person that closes every weekend where I work at uh, and we're so shorthanded that they denied my, my shifts. My, there has my also been protests here in Dallas, Texas in front of the city hall and um, I went with one of my cousins, but um, they kind of don't allow pro protests here in Dallas since it's packed, you know. But um, I am not going to lie. I am too scared. And you, you have, like, how do I say it? You would actually go over there. I would be scared to travel to, to D.C. <laughs> and so many people are scared to travel. Like, I didn't even know I could travel, you know, like. It's something that you just, t it's taken away from you, you know, your freedom. And, um, but protesting can um, improve. And um, I believe that writing also to the government and sharing your experiences and uh, putting your voice out there. If you put your, your story, your voice, you will be heard and many people will be considering us instead of seeing us as bad people doing crimes or as Trump says, rapes is, or, you know, just all the bad stuff that he said, you know? Um, how old can you start Excuse me? How old can you start? Um, you have to be 16. Um, no. yeah, as long as you were here from, like, a certain, what was it, like, June 2000 and, um, it was like, it's yeah, it, there was like a certain day that you had to have been here bef uh, before that date. Literally like a date, like you know, like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, a specific date. And from yeah. there, mm -hmm. and you had to have proof that you had been here with yeah. documents, yeah. I have a question. Yes. Uh, what have you heard perhaps from other DACA students? What would they do if they were, say, deported, would they intend to try to stay here or to try to go and come back later or just abandon the U.S.? I was speaking to my cousin about that and um, she mentioned that she actually graduated from college from uh, A&M and um, she said she would try and come back over here because she said her life is here and all her opportunities are here and she wouldn't like to throw all that away. But um, we would have to start from zero again, which is not easy at all. 
that's what I've heard too. It's not like it's kind of weird because once your DACA expires, like I, I don't know if it's gonna be like crazy and you know, like they will come knocking on your door because they they have everything. Like they have literally your like your fingerprints, phone number, like address. Have everything. So, like, if it was to get crazy enough, they could literally like just grab a like, print out all the information and go knocking from door to door, uh, with a, you know, deportation notice and just be like, hey, you're coming with us, and you can't really do anything about it. So, like, you, oh, I'm really hoping that that's never gonna happen, and I'm just like, you know, just running my imagination because of all the movies that I've seen, like, you know, <laughs> crazy imagination. Um, but if, I think, like, once your DACA expires, like, we're, we're not just going to, like, freely, like, walk out, you know. Like, all right, like, my time is up. Like, mm -hmm. see y'all later. Like, I don't think that's going to happen. Like, I think we're all It's really hard to stay. think that you're going to start all over again somewhere where you were not raised somewhere where you know you're from, but I mean, it really would be hard to start a life somewhere where you've never been, you know? And I mean, it's different to where if you were like traveling and you know you're happy about it and stuff, but this is a place where opportunities aren't seen a lot, you know? It's it's just really sad to, to start all over again once you already started here, you know? And here it's differently because we were here since we were small so we kind of just grew up here but as being at, being an adult already and going back it would be really tough and it's like adjusting to a whole new different thing just because like I don't think it's talked about as much and actually like I'm glad I'm taking a Professor Irashiki's class just because I've learned a lot of refugees and all the, all this, like all everything that they're going through. And Mexico is not that much different. Like it's really not. Like I talk to my aunts and uncles and cousins and everything that goes down there, it's so hushed by the, by the government that it, there's like killings every day. Like horrible like very graphic things that like go through and you, you don't hear about it in the news like you don't know about it so like for me to be able to like I I can go out to Walmart at 2 o'clock in the morning if I want to like drive up there and just like hey just you know walk around get whatever I need go back home I can't do that in Mexico I would not be able to do that because you can't trust anybody like you cannot trust the police and you cannot Yes, police officer over there. You can, you can pay them, and they'll let anything go. Literally, they can. You can just. They can stop you, and they'll check you, but you're paying them to let you go. Like, if they see a crime, they pay them to. Like you didn't see anything, you know. And I mean, that's what police officers are for to help, to help serve our community and for us to be stronger, you know. And they don't work that way. Like, my cousins said that they would trust more the drug cartel that is in my hometown than the actually police. Like, I, I don't, I don't want to go back. Like, I can't go to that. Like, I can't. Like, it's just, there's just, there's no way. Like, I can't live like that. Yeah, there's an article in the, uh, the handout you have about uh, DACA students speaking out, and it's, it's kind of a, a risky thing to, you know, be politically uh, visible here. So uh, I want to thank uh, Michelle and Sonia very much for coming.